In this lecture, we'll be talking about some challenges for Kant's moral theory. Uh, just like utilitarianism, uh, Kant's moral theory does have some difficulties with it, some, uh, some real reasonable troubles that it runs into. Although, again, uh, Kant or Kantians have reasonable replies uh, to most of these challenges, and they're not the sort of challenges that should make one immediately uh, just completely give up on Kantianism. Uh, the reason we think about these challenges and, and present them this way is to understand uh, Kant's moral theory and what Kant actually says uh, a little bit better. So the first of the challenges I'd like to talk about is uh, what's uh, called the, the challenge of moral motivation. Um, certainly, most of the moral theories that we have, certainly utilitarianism included, uh, face some version of this challenge. Uh, it, it's, it's strongest with Kant, but many moral theories face it. The idea is that when we have a moral theory, a theory of what's right or wrong or good or bad, uh, a lot of times one might say, well, okay, you've told me what's good about a particular action, but why should I actually want to do it, um, given that it may not be actually best for me? And so it's the why be moral uh, question. Uh, utilitarianism runs into this question in the sense that the action with the best overall consequences may not be an action that actually benefits the person who's supposed to do it. Um, and, and likewise, that can be the case with Kant. For Kant, your duty is not always a thing that will help you in any way or that will get you what you want. Um, and so Kant, like others, has to sort of answer this challenge. And so here's how this version of it, uh, the, known as the amoralist challenge, goes. Uh, the first premise of the argument is that people have a reason to do something only if doing it will get them what they care about. Okay, And we can talk about that, the truth of that premise. Uh, we can consider it may not in fact be true, but it seems at least plausible enough to start. Uh, the second premise is that doing their moral duty sometimes fails to get people what they care about. That, alas, seems quite true. And therefore, uh, this leads to the conclusion that people sometimes lack any reason to do their moral duty. Right? So the, the argument is is valid. Uh, and it extends. Okay, We uh, start uh, off using the conclusion as the first premise of the next argument, and then add the second one. If people sometimes lack any reason to do their moral duty, then violating their moral duty can be rational. Therefore, the conclusion is that it can be rational for people to violate their moral duty. Now, this particular argument connects with Kant, remember, because of the centrality of reason in Kant's uh, thinking. Kant thinks that to be rational is to understand your moral duty, um, uh, and that moral duty only applies to rational beings, and it applies categorically to all rational beings. And so uh, the idea is that uh, there, if there's a disconnect between reason and moral motivation, then that would seem to be a problem for specifically Kant's moral theory. And here is Kant's reply. Uh, it starts off with the premise that if you are rational, then you are consistent. And this is a plausible criterion for rationality, is uh, consistency. So being consistent means that you have beliefs that, that your, your beliefs, your whole set of them, can all be true at the same time. That is, that you don't have two different beliefs that just can't both be true. Uh, so if I you know, believe a, a particular vase is blue and also believe that same vase has no color, uh, those would be inconsistent beliefs. They're beliefs that can't be true at the same time. So it seems reasonable to say that a rational person uh, would not have inconsistent beliefs. And so uh, this first premise, if you are rational, then you are consistent, uh, seems true. The second premise, he says that if you are consistent, then you obey the principle of universalizability. Right? Uh, again, consistent in this sense, uh, again, is going to refer to uh, things being able to be true at the same time. Remember, universalizability uh, is, is about willing a particular maxim to be universal, that is, to be the same for everybody. If you want to say that the moral law is, is one way for some people and another way for other people, uh, then that would seem to be inconsistent, at least in some way. Um, and so, again, it looks like premise two might, might uh, succeed, uh, although there's a possible danger of equivocation here. Maybe those two uses of consistent aren't exactly the same. But in any case, premise three is that if you obey the principle of universalizability, then you act morally. And that does, if you put them all together, lead to the conclusion that if you are rational, then you act morally. Uh, uh, or, or else the true contrapositive of the conclusion uh, that if you act immorally, then you are irrational. And so for Kant, that's his uh, attempt to uh, bridge the gap between uh, reason and motivation, right? That, uh, you know, if, um, uh, the, that if one is, is acting immorally, then one is irrational uh, because of the inconsistency in violating the principle of universalizability. 
so these are these are the sorts of arguments and counter arguments that are uh, available in uh, Schaefer Landau's text. I think you can add to it one other thing, uh, and that there is a couple of different ways in which the word rational is used uh, in these couple of arguments. In the objection, it, it seems to be they seem to say. Uh, a person can be rational and violate their moral duty at the same time, uh, or that people can have a reason to violate their moral duty, um, or they can be rational in doing so. And I think what that sense of rational means is the sense of rational in the sentence, there's got to be a rational explanation for this, right? That is uh, something that can explain why something happened. Certainly, we understand why sometimes people violate their moral duties, uh, perhaps because there's some advantage, some personal advantage for them in doing so. And that doesn't make it right, but it, at least it makes it understandable, right? It, it, you can explain it, right? And that's, the th that's one sense of reasonable or rational is that it can be explained. Another sense of rational is, uh, you know, when somebody talks about um, having a, uh, you know, uh, having a rational motive, motivation for doing something or, 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 or a, a, the way that Kant means rational is he means having a good justification that is a good reason to do something, uh, having good um, motivations, a, a good justification as opposed to a good explanation. And so, uh, you know, Kant thinks that there's all the connection in the world between uh, rationality and between morality. Uh, but of course, the objector may, may be using this other sense of the word. They may be talking past each other. Um, in any case, uh, that is uh, Kant's reply to the uh, amoralist challenge. Uh, in, in further thinking about Kant's moral theory, we want to think about his first test, right? This, this idea of the principle of universalizability. While it gives us some really plausible results, um, in, in, for example, it explains why stealing and lying, et cetera, uh, are immoral um, because they can't be you know, made universal. Uh, it certainly contains some plausible ideas behind it. Um, but it does have some some defects, some uh, uh, strangeness involved in uh, how it works. Uh, for example, it may permit some acts that seem impermissible. I'm just going to refer you to Schaefer Landau's a sort of fanatic uh, law and order example he describes in the text uh, as one thing that uh, it would seem as if the principle of universalizability permits this, um, even though you know, just from, from the outside, it seems like that shouldn't be permissible. So a theory that did permit that, we might say maybe there's something wrong with the theory. Um, but also it may also, it may prohibit some acts that seem in, that, that seem permissible, that seem like they're perfectly all right. Uh, my favorite example of this is something like collecting toy trains. Now it seems like it should be perfectly morally permissible for a person to collect toy trains, right? I don't think we, we think that there's anything particularly wrong with this. But consider running this through uh, Kant's uh, principle of universalizability. So what does it mean to collect a toy train, right? You know, to, to collect toy trains in general. It's, uh, well, it means that you would buy them, but not sell them, right? That's, that's sort of how collecting works, right? You buy them, but you don't sell them. Uh, now let's universalize that. So if everybody bought toy trains, but never, nobody sold them, uh, that's plainly logically inconsistent. Right? And so it seems like because that couldn't be a thing that everybody could do, that it shouldn't be something that anybody does. And that's a pretty disturbing uh, result. And uh, there are a variety of ways to try and, you know, sort of rejigger uh, Kant's universalizability formula not to have certain results, but, but those also have, have their issues. And so this is something of a challenge. Um, and I, I do, though, think it's fair to say that this is a challenge in expressing the principle of universalizability not so much a challenge to the general idea behind the principle of universalizability. After all, I, I, we do really think that there's something wrong with people making an exception for themselves or treating their own interests or interests of like persons as inherently more important than, than others' interests. Right? I th we, we think that there really is something wrong with that. And uh, perhaps Kant's specific formulation of the principle of universalizability was an imperfect way to get across uh, that particular uh, basic idea that, that might really be you know, core to morality. So you know, it, it's a challenge, but it's not necessarily uh, fatal to uh, uh, something like uh, what Kant proposes. There's also uh, a, a, another major objection that I want to spend a little more time on. Uh, is the challenge of absolute moral duties. That's how uh, Schaefer Lando sort of refers to it. Um, in other literature, uh, this is referred to as the dire consequences objection uh, to Kant's moral theory. 
And so in a, in a kind of famous case, right, that Schaefer Landau mentions on page 172, uh, Kant argues in favor of telling the truth unconditionally, right? And in fact, um, uh, Schaefer Landau just sort of mentions the case, uh, but there's a writing that Kant himself, you know, Kant himself writes that's part of your assignment for this unit, uh, where he gives you, he's going to give you the full argument in just such a case. Um, and so uh, the case is something like this. Uh, say somebody, you know, comes up to your, uh, somebody comes up to your house and, you know, it, it's, it's a friend of yours and they say, oh, there's this person who's trying to kill me, you know, can I hide in your house? And being your, their friend, you say, oh, of course you can hide in my house. And then some time later, this person that's trying to kill your friend uh, comes to your door and says, is your friend in there? Right? And so now you're, you're asked point blank. Now, it seems like if you just sort of like said nothing at all, like that, that would be just as the same as, as saying, yeah, he's in here. Uh, and so in some sense, silence is not a real option here. And so you're in a situation where you have to say something. Uh, and the question is, are you allowed to lie in this situation? Right. And this is one of those cases, you know, th those cases where most people, I think, would probably say, yes, yes, you're allowed to lie in this circumstance. And Kant is going to defend uh, the position that that you are not allowed to lie in this circumstance, that it's immoral, uh, just like any other lie. And what I wanted to really, uh, uh, I want you to notice here is that this is weirdly the other side of, of the coin uh, uh, that gets, you know, that gets you to in some trouble. So the utilitarian gets to say of a case like this, look, we have the best moral theory because we can say, of course, you can lie in a circumstance like this one, even if lying most often doesn't generate the best overall in this case, it might, and so, you know, you can lie in this case. And it makes people feel pretty good about utilitarianism. But then when we get to the, the question of uh, having to, you know, put to death an innocent person for the sake of the best overall consequences, well, now all of a sudden we don't like how flexible utilitarianism is and would prefer a moral theory that just says, no, you cannot ever kill the innocent, period. Right? And so um, this is, like I said, this is the other, this is the other side of that coin. And when Kant says that the consequences are just not relevant to morality, he means, you know, one reasonable way to say, what, what do you mean? What if they're really bad consequences? And, and Kant's going to have to toe the line. because going to say, well, even there, they're still not relevant to morality. Um, and so uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a big scale, you know, famous objection. Uh, so in Kant's article uh, on the right to lie uh, from, uh, for supposedly philanthropic motives, etc. That's a long, complicated title because it's Kant. Uh, he, he, he's going to defend uh, his, his, his moral view that, that you, know, you, really, you really do still have to tell the truth, even in cases such as this. And uh, so as you read through it, you'll, you'll again notice it's Kant, it's Kant's writings, so we have to take some time with it. Uh, but I wanted to highlight some of the things that Kant really does uh, say that come sort of out of that article. And so he's going to give us a number of arguments or a number of, of, of uh, ways that explain his reasoning uh, that lying is simply categorically impermissible. Like it's just immoral no matter what the consequence, uh, good or bad. Okay. And the first thing he wants to do is draw a distinction between wronging somebody and harming somebody. And oddly enough, this is a distinction that a utilitarian can't really draw. Because a utilitarian it, it concerns themselves with the consequences in terms of pleasures and pains, then wronging and harming really are just the same thing, right? Harming is to cause a pain, wronging is to cause a pain. So, uh, so it's interesting that the utilitarian can't make a distinction between wronging and harming somebody, but a Kantian can, and Kant thinks that that's one of the strong points of this moral approach. And so uh, to harm somebody, right, is to have some action of yours cause some pain or misfortune to somebody else. And we generally only regard such a thing as wrong morally if the harm is intentional or due to negligence. And this seems to indicate that what is, uh, what is wrong with such acts is not that they harm, but rather the kind of action that it is. And so a couple of examples. Uh, so attempted murder is very seriously morally wrong, even when it does no harm. Okay, you might, if you tried to kill somebody but sort of failed to do them any harm, that wouldn't excuse what you did. And again, that's something that a utilitarian has a really hard time coming to grips with. Um, and of course, negligence, okay, is to wrong somebody by, by putting them in danger of harm, right, uh, by your, you know, by, by not being careful enough, even if that harm never actually occurs. And again, the utilitarian has a, a really hard time uh, accounting for that. 
and also some harms are clearly not wrongs. So, uh, for example, imagine that you owned a business and uh, uh, you, you know, through through uh, wonderful customer service and you know really diligent attention to detail and and by uh, you know developing your product to be the best it can possibly be, uh, you end up putting your competitor out of business. Uh, and uh, you know the owner of your you know the other business, uh, you have harmed them, right? You know, going out of business is is you know is sort of painful and is it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but it doesn't seem like you have wronged that person. You have not done anything that is you you've not you know treated them like a thing. You have not done anything that's non-universalizable. You've you know you you have through your actions uh, caused some harm to another. Um, now again, a utilitarian is not going to be able to sort of distinguish between the sorts of things you, you know, they're not going to factor intent in, uh, they're only going to consider just, just the consequences and that's all. So importantly to the case uh, of, of, you know, this person coming to you and saying, is your friend in there, um, you would be, you would not be responsible for any harm in this case, but you would be responsible for any wrong. That is, if somebody goes and harms your friend, that's not that's you're not responsible for that they are responsible for that but if you lie to them you are responsible for that right and you so you're responsible for wronging somebody but not if you tell the truth and something happens to somebody else you are not responsible for what happens to somebody else you, it, it's you're responsible for the harm but not a wrong okay that's the, the first argument the second uh, uh justification that Kant offers for telling the truth in cases like this is that he says that lies do harm to the moral law generally. Okay? And uh, he puts it this way. He says that most legal codes, for example, only regard as illegal a lie that does harm to the person that's lied to. But uh, as, I, as I, I hope you sort of understand that morality is, is much more expansive than the law, right? You know, the law is one particular thing that we can evaluate from the moral perspective. Um, morality is a lot more thoroughgoing than the law. Even if a lie does not harm the person that is lied to, uh, or even if that lie helps yourself or somebody else, it does damage right to moral duty itself. Right in Kant's words, it it vitiates the very source of rightness. And this is uh, uh, almost it sounds almost mystical the way that Kant writes it. Uh, and again, it's because Kant's a sort of terrible writer. Uh, I think really what he means is that. Uh, it it does damage to something like the fabric of society, if we're going to use uh, that kind of a metaphor. Uh, if you think about it this way, um, there's, uh, the, the, I guess my favorite example is this, there's a really old joke uh, where, you know, somebody, you know, uh, picks a, a friend of theirs up and has given them a ride someplace and they're driving along, driving along, and they just sort of blow right through a red light. And, you know, you're, you're the passenger objects and, hey, whoa, watch out, the light was red. And the guy says, don't worry about it. My brother drives this way. And then, you know, there's an up, up, up comes another red light and he blows right through it. You know, cars honking, people, you know, brakes screeching. And, and, and you're like, geez, you got to stop for those red lights. So don't worry about it. My brother drives this way. And of course, the next intersection comes up and there's a green light and he slams on the brakes and, you know, all the traffic piles up behind him. And, you know, uh, he says, why did you stop? That's a green light. And he says, look, my brother might be coming the other way. Right? The, the, the point of this illustration is that just imagine like how many drivers would it take who actually drove that way right as opposed to the right way uh, to basically make nobody trust what the intersection said at all like uh, red light green light you're just stopping anyway and making sure no, and it, like how many such drivers would it take for utter chaos to reign and i think the answer is a surprisingly small number right and so if 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 a fairly small number of people all of a sudden don't think the rules apply to them then that's going to sort of make the whole system such that people don't really believe the law the rules apply to them either um and such a thing can get out of control pretty quickly um the idea is that the reason that um that we regard lying as as so odious uh, is because it takes advantage of everybody else's good behavior and if enough people profit from taking advantage of everyone else's good behavior well then this this creates a reason why we shouldn't you know continue behaving well uh if, you know no one else is going to do it and so again he says the, the lie sort of does a kind of damage right to to the moral fabric itself um, and i think uh, his point is that lying is more seriously morally wrong even when it does no harm in a particular case than you might think This justification here is that lying is an attempt to manipulate the situation in a way that telling the truth isn't. All right. 
Um, and this is another uh, sort of semi-consequentialist argument, but uh, again, it's just as, uh, presented as an independent justification for his view. Uh, Kant thinks it's plausible, as again, some legal codes have it, um, that if a lie of yours is causally responsible for some bad consequence, you bear responsibility even without intent. So the idea is this, that if you tell the truth and somebody uses the truth to do whatever they do, you're not responsible for them using things that are true to decide what to do, right? Um, you know, you've not attempted to manipulate the situation in any way by just telling the truth. Whereas lying is an attempt to manipulate the situation. If you lie to somebody and then they take an action based on your lie, then you're responsible for whatever happens, even if you didn't foresee that outcome. Uh, and that's uh, a very interesting point, right? So, I mean, imagine in our case, in the, in the example, that uh, your friend comes to your house and says, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hide in this person's house because I know they're completely honest, right? And so, uh, you know, you, you ask, can I hide in your house? They tell you you can. So you go in there and you say, okay, now first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to sneak right out the back door because what will happen is this other person will come behind me and he'll ask my friend, say, Khan, right? uh, hey, is, is my friend? Is your friend in there? And Kant, being an honest person, will say, well, yes, he is. And so then the person who's going to kill me will come into the house, but I'll be long gone by then, right? Well, so what happens instead is that, uh, you know, uh, now imagine you know, somebody, you, you ask Kant, can I hide in your house? And he says, yes, you can. So you hide, you know, you hide in his house, you start sneaking out the back door. And then the person who's trying to kill you comes by and says, um, hey, Kant, is your friend in the house? And Kant says, uh, you know, <laughs> defies everyone's expectations and lies. Says, oh, no, of course he's not. He's not in here. And then the person who's trying to kill you, like, you know, says, oh, my goodness, well, Kant's a very honest person. You know, he would never lie, even in situations like this. And so it continues on around the house, catches uh, catches you coming out the back door and kills you. Well, now Kant's responsible for, for your death, right? Because he tried to he lied to manipulate the situation, even though he intended that the lie would spare your life. Uh, but if it cost you your life, well, that's it. He's responsible now, um, at least in some legal codes. Again, it's, it's not, it doesn't fit neatly into his moral theory, uh, but it's a it's a nice independent justification for, uh, you know, telling it the truth even in such situations. But then uh, uh, finally, he's going to, uh, not finally, but next he's going to give uh, another justification for telling the truth. Um, and this one does fit in very nicely with his moral theory. And it's just, he says, look, consequences don't matter, even dire consequences. So the fact that some action, telling the truth, also caused harm but not wrong to somebody is an accident of the case. That is, the particular consequences of each token act don't change the moral status of that action type. Right? If the reason that it is right to tell the truth is not because it always benefits everyone, then the fact that it sometimes harms is not a reason not to tell the truth. Okay? Um, so another way to put this is that actions should be free of what's called resultant moral luck. Okay, so say that you tell uh, tell the truth and something good happens as a result of it, and then another person tells the truth and something bad happens as a result of it. Well, if you're a utilitarian, then it seems like there's been some moral luck going on, right? That the person, the, the people might have had, you know, just as clear thought processes in both cases. They must have had just as pure motives in both case, cases, but one of them ended up doing the right thing, the other one didn't. Right? That's that's what we call resultant moral luck. Uh, Kant thinks there should be no such thing. Uh, and so Kant's theory says, look, you, you should you should be making your decision based on the type of action that it is. And that's not something that changes uh, from one situation to another. The consequences do change from one situation to another, and you don't have any control over that. Uh, what you do have control over in this case is what you actually do in a particular type of the case. And so if you just say, well, I just don't lie, well, great. There's no result in moral luck. If you lie, you've done something wrong, whether something good or bad happens as a result of it. And if you tell the truth, you've done the right thing, regardless of whether something good or bad happens because of it, right? Uh, it has a non-consequentialist theory of morality. And so uh, the next uh, argument that Kant gives uh, is that, that you should know the moral status of an act at the same time as the time you act, okay? And consequentialism, of course, would make this impossible. He's going to say that he handles this case better than the consequentialist does. Uh, and so here's a, a quote from Kant. He says, the man who is asked whether or not he intends to speak truthfully in the statement that he is now to make, and who does not receive the very question with indignation as regards the suspicion thereby expressed that he might be a liar, but who instead asks permission to think first about possible exceptions, 
that man is already a liar in potentia. This is because he shows that he does not acknowledge truthfulness as in itself a duty, but reserves for himself exceptions from a rule which by its very nature does not admit of any exceptions, inasmuch as to admit of such would be self-contradictory. Again, uh, with typical Kantian clarity, uh, he states this. And so, so again, just imagine you're, you're in a circumstance uh, where you say, okay, now, uh, are you going to tell me the truth here, right? And if the person, the, the, you imagine two kinds of reactions. Imagine one reaction where somebody says, what do you mean am I going to tell the truth? Of course I'm going to tell the truth. What, do you, what, what kind of a person do you think I am, right? And the other person says, well, let me think about that for a minute uh, and, and think about any potential cases in which, you know, lies would be the right thing to do. Right? It's like, which of, the, which of the people do you think regards truth-telling in the appropriate light, morally speaking? Uh, and that's, that's Kant's intuition here. And so his final argument against uh, for the sort of categorically impermissib categorical impermissibility of lies uh, is this, that for it to be a moral principle at all, it must not contain some element of conditionality or else it isn't really a moral principle, right? Um, and again, this is a, a quote from Kant. He says, all practical principles of right must contain rigorous truth. And the principles that are here called middle principles can contain only the closer determination of the application of these latter principles, according to the rules of politics, to cases that happen to occur. But such middle principles can never contain exceptions to the aforementioned principles of right. This is because such exceptions would destroy the universality on account of which alone they bear the name of principles. Okay. So again, uh, this is a, a typically uh, typically Kantian in its, in its clarity or unclarity. Um, and so what he's saying is this, right? Uh, when he talks about these middle principles that, uh, you know, that, uh, that apply these principles to the, according to the rules of politics, what he means is that uh, if you look at things like rules or codes of law or things like that, uh, what these things typically do is they try and apply these general uh, principles of morality to specific cases. And when you try and do that, that's necessarily imperfect because you can't foresee all the specific cases that occur. And so what he's, what he's talking about is, is, is what we often call the spirit of the law, right? Um, and so a, a law might be written a certain way or a rule might be written a certain way uh, that in a particular case, it seems like it's being misapplied. Uh, but, but there's always a kind of spirit of the rule behind it. There's, there's the, the reason why you have such a rule. And for th those are the sorts of things that Kant thinks are, are just completely universal and completely inviolable. He says you, you never go against, you know, the spirit of, of a rule, even if, if you might sometimes uh, go against its letter. And, and he thinks that, that the rule to be truthful, to be honest, is one of those, right? That, that, that truthfulness um, in, in everything you say and do um, is one of those things that doesn't contain any exceptions, right? It is the spirit of so many rules that we have. Um, uh, and that's why, uh, you know, lying is still sort of categorically impermissible. It, you know, you, you, it can't be a principle unless it's universal in just that way. All right. So there's, there's that, that was the, the, uh, the dire consequences objection. Uh, the next trouble that Kantian moral theory sometimes runs into uh, is, is uh, that of conflicts between duties. Uh, and so the the case we've been talking about, where somebody you know comes to your door and says, "Hey, is your friend hiding in there? I want to kill him," and you know you have to say yes if if you're following Kant's moral theory. Uh, it may be that that kind of a case simply involves conflict between duties, right? Because it seems like we you do have some duty to to try and protect people, okay, to to try and uh, prevent harm, right? I think we do have at least some plausible moral duty to do that, but we also have a duty to tell the truth. I think that's that's uh, at some level undeniable. And so it may be that this is a case in which two duties, things that really are your duty, come into conflict and that you have to have some method of resolving that conflict. Um, so another possible example might be this. So consider promising someone to meet them for lunch, but then on your way to the lunch appointment, you stumble upon a shallow pond in which a child is drowning. If you help the child, you will certainly break your promise. Like you're going to have to you're spend, gonna spend enough time dealing with this that you're not going to be able to make lunch. And it, so it seems clear in a case like this that duties really can conflict, okay? Um, uh, but of course, Kant really didn't think they could. Uh, and that's one of the things where, you know, um, maybe he, you know, you know, maybe he, maybe he was right about that. Maybe he was wrong about that. Um, 
but it seems like uh, duties really can sort of very clearly conflict, and so Kant himself has some some trouble accounting for that. Um, and the universal the universalizability formula doesn't really handle this well at all, right? If it tells you not to do uh, one particular thing and not to do another particular thing, and you find some circumstance where you have to do one or the other, uh, I don't know. It seems uh, seems troublesome. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Kantians themselves uh, might respond in a number of ways. They might say, well, Kant himself didn't talk about the conflicts of duties very well, but we can come up with some plausible uh, principles that can help you resolve such conflicts among duties. Right. The final trouble that Kant's moral theory does run into uh, is uh, some troubles with the, the scope of the moral community. That is, uh, who is included in the moral community and, uh, and to what extent and why. So uh, here's how it goes. If reason is supposed to be the thing that provides uh, the moral law, then anyone who does not have the full use of reason would not be part of the moral community. Right? That's the way it goes. If, if morality is for rational beings, then those who are not rational beings uh, are outside of the moral community. And so consider, for example, this is what we call the, uh, a version of a marginal cases argument. Uh, consider small children, animals, uh, and those with very serious mental disabilities. It seems right to say that they are a part of the moral community, but of course Kant's view appears to exclude them. Um, and so it seems like for, for Kant you've got rational beings, which are you know fully you know part of the moral community, and you have rocks, which are not at all. And so it seems like these these like small children, animals, and those with serious mental disabilities have the moral status of rocks uh, because they don't have the full use of rationality. So that seems to be a, a trouble for Kant. Um, now, Kant himself actually considered this objection, uh, and he was bothered by it, right? Uh, it, it was uh, specifically uh, in terms of uh, how people would have to treat uh, animals, you know, you know, cats, dogs, horses, that sort of thing. Because um, he, he certainly didn't think that it was perfectly okay for you just to treat a horse however you wanted it. You know, um, he, was, he, was, he was bothered by that consequence of his moral theory. And so one of the things uh, that that he did is he, he he brought up an argument that he thought dealt with this objection. Uh, and in all honesty, his attempt is pretty lame. Uh, so what he argued was that we should not mistreat animals and children, etc., because it would make us brutal in our treatment of rational adults. Right? It would sort of uh, you know do some sort of moral damage to us in a way that might make us then uh, more likely to disregard our duties toward rational beings. Um, but of course, you know. Uh, the reason this is a lame response is because if there wasn't actually anything morally wrong with mistreating animals and children, then there would be no reason why such behavior would create like a bad habit or a bad precedent or uh, make something somebody brutal. Right? Uh, after all, we don't think that kicking rocks too much makes it more likely that you'll start kicking people. Okay, And if, if animals really did have just the same moral status as rocks, this wouldn't be any better. So uh, again, Kant's, Kant's actual attempt to deal with this objection is, is, is pretty lame, but nobody's perfect. Um, of course, Kantians right, can come up with something better. And so really, Kant needed to make explicit an assumption that he, he in fact does make, um, that there's a difference between a moral subject and a moral agent. Okay. A moral subject is something that can be the subject of a moral act. That is, it can be morally wronged, or you can do the right thing by this thing. A moral agent is something that can themselves do right or wrong because they sort of appreciate the difference. Okay. So a moral agent can act in a way that is moral or immoral. A moral subject can have something right or wrong done to them. Right? They can be the subject of morality, but not necessarily an agent. A, a regular adult human being is both a moral subject and a moral agent. They can be morally responsible for what they do, and you can wrong a person uh, morally, or you can do right by them morally. Um, something like, uh, you know, most, most animals, I think we would generally agree are moral subjects, right? You know, that it would be wrong to just walk up and kick an animal in the face. Uh, that's, you know, uh, that would do wrong to the animal. But we don't think that most of the lower animals are moral agents, right? When you say good dog or bad dog, you don't mean morally good dog or morally bad dog. Um, you're holding them morally responsible for their actions, even though you think that they can be the subject of morality, right? So uh, most animals tend to be moral subjects, but not moral agents, right? Uh, 
it takes a little more creativity to try and think of something that would be considered a moral agent, but not a moral subject. But I think history gives us at least some precedent of those who are treated in, in that particular way. Uh, somebody who was uh, thought to be able to do right or do wrong, that is to be held accountable for what they do, but to themselves not really be subject uh, uh, to morality, uh, that is you can't really wrong them necessarily, um, is uh, again, you know, within suitable definitions of context, uh, something like slaves. I think slaves were sort of treated this way, like they were held responsible for uh, morality, but were not really considered full moral subjects, especially not with respect to uh, those that owned them. Uh, so uh, again, you can you can think of, of at least some examples where uh, something was an agent, but not a subject, or a subject, but not an agent, uh, or, or something that's both. Again, normal adult human beings uh, are both moral agents and moral subjects. And of course, rocks are neither moral subjects nor moral agents. And so Kant's theory explains uh, that the use of reason is what makes something a moral agent, and that does actually seem right. Okay, it seems like the, the the best reason to consider someone a moral agent is because they're rational, that they can appreciate the distinctions between right and wrong. However, his assumption that the use of reason is also what makes something a moral subject is really doubtful. It seems like things can be moral sub moral subjects even if they're not fully rational. But Here's the thing. On the other, if we look at utilitarianism, it has a very good explanation for what makes something a moral subject. That is, that it feels pain or pleasure, right? If something feels pain, it seems wrong to cause that pain in it, right? Um, at least without some really good reason. But less of a as, 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 utilitarianism is much less of a story about what makes something a moral agent, right? What is it that that makes somebody to be held responsible? Of course, you know. It can't just be that that you know only moral agents' actions have consequences, right? When pigs do things, their actions have consequences, right? Does that make them moral agents? So, so again, this is one of those things that uh, people very often use as a challenge against uh, Kant. That Kant has um, a theory that doesn't that doesn't give us a very good story on what makes somebody a moral subject or not, and that's true. It, it, you know, he he doesn't very well account for what makes something a moral subject. Um, but even though utilitarianism does have a really good story about what makes somebody a moral subject, they don't have a very good story about what makes somebody a moral agent, and Kant really does. Okay, and so it seems like, uh, again, these two theories tend to sort of uh, um, have their, each other's strengths and weaknesses match up in a, in a very strange sort of a way. Uh, just like the dire consequences objection and the the problem of justice uh, or flexibility uh, are, are also sort of two sides of the same coin. And so uh, to to sum up, right, the uh, keep want you to keep track of some of the major difficulties that Kant's moral theory has, as well as the way that Kantians reply uh, to those difficulties. Uh, so uh, first off, the the dire consequences objection is certainly one to keep track of. Uh, and uh, to keep track of how Kant re does reply to that and the various strengths and weaknesses of, of, of Kant's variety of replies. Uh, certainly there's this notion that uh, Kantian moral theory has difficulty accounting for conflicts of duties. Um, we'll be taking a look at other non-consequentialist theories of morality that uh, uh, that that purport to handle this, this uh, issue better than Kant does. Uh, and also keep in mind the challenge to Kantian moral theory that it has too narrow a moral community. So those are all uh, challenges that help us to learn something more about how Kantian moral theory really works uh, and about some of its really good points, as well as some of its challenges.